one question I would like to stress is we have the rules and the guidelines for fasting, at least in Germany and I would say in Europe, are coming from studies designed for massive overweight persons. We heard body mass index 40, 50, 60. And nobody until now in the panels who judge the fasting are there to consider uh, the therapeutical aspect of fasting outside of the weight reduction and the subsequent uh, improvement of health, which are the diminution of the insulin resistance, triglyceride, etc. So, my question here in this panel is, does a normal weighted person who wants to fast for therapeutical reasons or who wants to practice a low protein diet to improve his outcome after surgery. Do you have to think differently if you are a massive obese person or if you are a normal weighted person or maybe a moderate obese person? I would like maybe to have your opinion and then we can uh, mm -hmm. pass the balls like this. Sure. Um, I think from, from my perspective, uh, you know, starting with the rodent research, um, all of the data that, much of the data I showed was in um, lean animals that aren't obese. So we're quite confident for short periods of time that they can activate these protein sparing um, beneficial stress resistance mechanisms. Um, we have done it in obese animals, and we've confirmed that we can see similar efficacy, but we haven't done nearly the studies to know if there are risks and, of course, there are mice. Um, the other, from my perspective, thinking about the aging process, the, the, the elephant in the room for us, what about in old obese animals? Do we see the same efficacy? And we heard um, from you that there, there's no upper limit to the ability of fasting. But I would also be curious to know from a clinical perspective if obesity and aging um, interact in a negative way. Ja, ich antworte mal in Deutsch, dann können Sie es alle gut verstehen. Ich denke, es wird übersetzt. I'm going to answer in German. Of course, we have obese patients. Those are high-risk patients where we, with our measures, have to be careful. And of course, people, lean people and adipose people, or obese people, can save proteins and make sure that they don't lose too many proteins because this can be lethal. We have a development of five million years. We've all learned to fast and to eat. If we eat too much, you either you have lipogenesis and say have fat tissue and if we fast then we can live on this fatty tissue that we've stored and the diets we developed are optimal for this but we didn't write the guidelines we can't do total fasting for patients if, if there is a damage to patients, or if they come to harm. Uh, if I may, just be a little bit confrontative. The question of these products, especially when you work with big companies, you have an excellent program. Uh, apparently, you were inspired even by ours, um, this multidisciplinary program. And can you finance a such program if you don't sell a product with it? We, we finance. We don't finance this product over the program. We're not financing the product, but the, the patient is financing the product because he is using the product instead of food. 
the cost for the program, medicine, psychology, um, exercise, that is assumed by the health insurance companies. That is a standard already, and we want to extend this. Could you just uh, precise so the, the protein, the hyperprotein diet has to be paid by the pa patient? Sure. Because it's like if you was eating at yes. home. So it is. Uh -huh. yeah. Yes. We say that otherwise the patient who is spending money on the formula um, diet would spend the money on food. And therapeutically that wouldn't be sensible for the health insurance company to pay for the food of a patient. Diese a medical teaching yeah. program, that's good. Uh, would you maybe um, tell us how you, you see now the perspective of, uh, of these regulations? Because now Professor Wexler says he has been um, implied his whole life in making regulation, you know, guidelines from the different company, from the different uh, uh, medical societies. Mm -hmm. uh, the adip uh, uh, overweight or adiposity society has had long to to struggle to have its own guidelines. Mm -hmm. uh, we are trapped in these guidelines because we would need a sort of uh, guidelines for, for fasting, not for fasting for uh, overweight. How, how do you see that from your perspective? If you are a preventive method with this protein restriction, for how do you go into regulations and <laughs> so, that's a much more difficult question. I'll, I'll just take a step back and say from my perspective, we need to figure out what goal we're trying to accomplish, um, and that will dictate what the diet, the severity of the diet, and, and more importantly, the timing. So for weight loss, and um, the professor showed that he can keep them at low nitrogen or nitrogen balance and keep them on these diets indefinitely. For our purposes, there's no need to do that. And that's why we can go to a more extreme 0% diet for a shorter period of time and we think trigger the metabolic changes that we're looking for um, in a way that makes it easier for the patient in, in a shorter time frame, the patient and the, and the surgeon. So that would be one set of purposes. Um, if you're going for longevity interventions, then you have to envision a completely different product, which is um, you know, first to be safe. So from that perspective, I think we're completely in agreement. Um, if you go to the protein and amino acid guidelines, they're not based, they're not done in, in aged people. Um, they're, they're done looking at nitrogen balance in young people. Mm. So I think we need to do some work on defining under different conditions, under different life stages, what might be appropriate. I don't think we know that at this point. Okay. That's going to be much more difficult. Uh, we were talking about positive effects of uh, autophagy, for instance, where you really recycle uh, amino acid. You will probably have a low, uh, um, uh, low nitrogen balance, uh, well, uh, nitrogen ba deficit, in negative nitrogen balance, which could be interpreted as positive if you want really to eliminate the old uh, proteic structures and you want that. Uh, 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 a huge synthesis of proteins starts afterwards to replace these old proteins. You know, I'm just saying, if you have people with 40, 50, 60 body mass index, there is nobody who can really discuss about it. It's, it's, it's another world. It's another world of it's Maybe it's our world, but yeah. when we talk about fasting for diseases, for therapeutic reasons, other than uh, weight loss, uh, it might be that the negative uh, nitrogen balance mm. is a good thing because you positive it afterwards. Uh, one, uh, word to a, light a few words on the guideline. You can see that Ms. Hemi and I have been discussing this problem for a longer time. We're trying to build bridges between these sciences. In the German adiposity Obesity society, we have these guidelines and say we don't recommend this for obese patients. But we have, we also don't recommend total fasting because the risks cannot be observed. But then we've discussed for a longer time 
when we founded our surgery for nutrition medicine, where we had patients who were obese or slim, and we couldn't tell them which therapy is the best for which patient. And that's why we have this freedom of therapy. And that is a problem when there are side effects or complications. And the second item is we talked about proteins. Protein substitution, we're discussing the regulations on this for um, elderly patients, for younger patients, and worldwide, and also in Europe, there is no one solution. Whether that's one gram, we say it's a bit higher, and the official opinion is not too low. So I don't know what that's going to um, for in, you. In your in case, it, well, you maybe want to answer directly. Yeah, no, I, I'll address uh, something that we think about um, in terms of guidelines, preoperative guidelines, particularly in Europe, are, are changing more toward the ERAS guidelines, mm -hmm. which has a nutritional component, which at face value might seem exactly the opposite to what I was showing. Yeah. It turns out it's not. So the ERAS guidelines dictate that um, periods of fasting prior to surgery, which we're used to, puts you into a catabolic state, which they, they judge isn't good. It leads to insulin resistance and, mm -hmm. and um, negative subjective well-being. So they recommend carbohydrate loading with clear beverages up to a few hours before surgery. So that's, of course, based on our data, entirely compatible with what we're saying. We're talking about a longer preconditioning period with reduced calories and, and reduced proteins ahead of time. To carbo-load ahead of the surgery would, wouldn't make any difference. I mean, yes, it is mildly protein sparing, but mm. it's completely compatible. Our challenge is to convince the audience, the surgeons, that that is the case. And I think herein lies the problem. The, the medical nutrition isn't to the level. They're not out here in your audience, so they don't see the latest results, and they're not thinking along those frames of mind. So I think the ERAS guidelines for us are, are currently beginning to pose an enormous challenge of translating these, because it just seems at face value that we're saying the opposite mm -hmm. when we're not really. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I would like just because, uh, you know, to discuss in 20 minutes these two talks that most of the people and probably the translator had difficulties to understand is a, is a challenge uh, per se. I, I would just like to ask uh, Yvon Le Maro, because he's a big specialist on this fuel utilization and penguins are able to go on long, long, long fasting period without modifast or optifast, no. <laughs> but probably is a mistake, but um, we could improve that in the Antarctic. Um, and he has, a, uh, he has seen that by these animals, they go until the end of the fat reserves and go even in the, in the um, ac activated protein catabolism and can reverse the, pro uh, the process. And this is something I always missed by you, uh, Mr. Bexler, is that you don't show us what happens after the fasting. And after the fasting, the, the nitrogen balance is extremely positive. Sure. Okay. Yeah. So it's reversible. It's reversible. Okay. Yeah. Maybe you tell us two words about what happens by the penguins, if you want to stay up and just... <laughs> First, uh, what I wanted to say that when I started the study on penguins, I thought they have mechanisms that we don't have, because they are doing better. Mm -hmm. But as I showed today, uh, they are using the same mechanism as newborn mammals to do better, uh, huddling together. This is the only difference. Mm -hmm. Considering the proportion of their energy, which comes from protein and lipid, it's exactly the same as for us. And we studied many uh, species of many animal species, and we found exactly the same mechanism of protein sparing, mm -hmm. which means that presumably it's a very old energy uh, protein saving uh, mechanism. Then, what about the signal which triggers refeeding before it is too late? Of course, we don't know if it exists in uh, humans. I think it does. Uh, but at least in animals, 
they anticipate a critical depletion. As I said today, they are triggered to refeed when not 100%, but 80% of their fat has disappeared. Mm. Then there is enough fat to, uh, as a fuel uh, to find, again, food. And it is regulated. So, for example, in a very small animals that have a high metabolic rate, it's exactly the same, but they decrease their body temperature during the night to still have 20% of their energy during the day. As to finish, because we don't have uh, much no. time, I want to say that, in my view, protein can be an accumulated fuel. Uh, usually people think it's not a fuel, but I think so. Because in all situations in animals when protein are needed, for example, uh, before malt, because uh, malt uh, means using protein to make a new plumage, they store a huge amount of protein. But they are always induced to refeed before about half percent of the muscle mass has disappeared. They refuel spontaneously before. And uh, we think that enfin, there are very uh, many evidence that in humans, 50% of a drop in protein mass is critical so for life, for survival. Yeah. Thank you very much. I think we... Do you want to add something, maybe? Just one point um, that I find fascinating is also evolutionarily conserved that few people think about, but we're also programmed when we or insects encounter unbalanced protein sources, which many of these diets that we're working with turn out to be interpreted that way the response is the opposite. It's an aversion, and it increases their activity to go find something else. So I think there's a, a, a work, and the, the combinations are endless of amino acids that can lead to, to these kinds of phenotypes. So I think there's a lot we don't know about protein metabolism still that we need to find out. Thank you. The metabolism regulation with penguins and also small mammals is comparable, definitely. But if the penguins lost 50% protein, he starts walking away and leaves his family behind to look for something to, to eat. And with human being, it's sing similar. Once you've lost a critical mass, it's critical for a, a healthy human being, it's 50%. And for a sick person, it can be 20% that's critical. It is our responsibility as physicians um, to make sure that we live up to re our responsibility here. Okay, thank you. To, to, to introduce the pause, uh, sometimes to go with questions is more important than to go with the answers. So, so in that sense, have a good pause. Hmm?